So I'm delighted to welcome here this evening um, Professor Ted Kashi, who's very kindly come up from Rome on this less than delightful day. Um, Professor Kashi is Professor of Romance Languages and Literatures at the University of Notre Dame, where he's also the director of the William and Catherine Devers program in Dante Studies and co-director of Italian Studies. Since 2015, also, he's been kind of my opposite number as inaugural um, academic director of the Notre Dame Rome Global Gateway, um, which he's been involved in, in setting up. He's extremely well known as a scholar of Dante, Petrarch, and Boccaccio, and he's also one of the leading world experts in the fashion, fascinating and currently extremely fashionable field of studies of travel writing and the intersection of literature and geography and cartography, which is what he'll be talking about this evening. Professor Kashi has published a great deal. I'm just going to talk a little about some of his major publications, which fall really into the two subject areas I was just mentioning. He's edited and co-edited um, various volumes for um, Notre Dame, reflecting the immense importance of that university and that program um, for Dante's studies. It runs important series of, of conferences, and his volumes have collected essays coming out of Notre Dame are Dante Now, Current Trends in Dante Studies, published in 1995, Le Culture di Dante, um, 2004, and Dante and Petrarch, Anti-Dantism, Metaphysics, Tradition, um, 2009. His other great publishing area is um, travel writing. His first book was Le Isole Fortunate, Fortunate Appunti di Storia Letteraria Italiana, published by Lerma di Brechtschneider in Rome in 1994, a very wide-ranging um, history of the treatment of the Canary Islands, Le Isole Fortunate in Italian literature from, from Dante to, to Tasso. He's also edited a couple of um, very important um, travel-related texts. The 16th century traveller Filippo Pigafetta's account of the first voyage around the world, um, published by the University of Toronto Press in 1995, with a second revised edition in 2007. And also, this book is a kind of personal favourite of mine, a, a rather little-known but very important and interesting text by Petrarch, his itinerary to the sepulchre of the Lord Jesus Christ, um, entitled, the edition is entitled, Petrarch's Guide to the Holy Land, and that came out with Notre Dame Press in 2002, and it won the Scaglione Prize for a manuscript in Italian literary studies from the Modern Languages Association. And Professor Cash's talk this evening has the very intriguing title which we see here, Mapping Italy in Dante, Petrarch and Boccaccio. Thank you, Virginia, for that very generous uh, introduction and, and really for the honor of the invitation to contribute something to the Acton Lectures. I'm, I'm really excited to be here and to be speaking about the three crowns in Florence. It's, it's, it's something that really uh, charges me up. So thank you for all coming on a rainy afternoon. There's a handout that you should all have. Historians of cartography have, for the most part, tended to focus their studies on the early modern geographical image of the Italian peninsula that became current following the reintroduction of Ptolemy's geography in Florence around 1400. And this is the point of view taken, for example, by Veronica della Dora in a recent essay titled Mapping Metageographies, the Cartographic Invention of Italy and the Mediterranean. According to Della Dora's account, a cartographic image of the peninsula only began to coalesce 
as a result of the late Quattro circulation of the maps that were printed with Ptolemy's geography. This perspective, however, overlooks the fact that various forms of cartographic writing in both poetic and prose genres had effectively fulfilled a cartographic function well before the mechanical reproduction of texts and images made possible the wide dissemination of maps. The tripartite survey that follows begins to explore the ways in which the three crowns, Dante, Petrarch, and Boccaccio, made canonical contributions to the cartographic invention of Italy and the Mediterranean well before the discovery of Ptolemy. Now, it shouldn't surprise us if Dante, Petrarch, and Boccaccio engaged in cartographic writing. All three were writing at the beginning of an epoch-making transition in the history of space that witnessed between the Due Trecento the birth of modern mapping, that is, of the nautical or Portolan chart, as well as the rediscovery of the fortunate Canary Islands around 1330, a harbinger of the age of discoveries. Ulysses' navigation beyond, and I quote from Inferno 26, the narrow strait where Hercules marked off the limits, Ulysses' navigation superbly expressed the energy and the anxieties of this historical transition on the eve of the rediscovery of the Canaries. Both Petrarch and Boccaccio registered and commented upon the event in their writings. Petrarch in an important passage in the De Vita Solitaria and Boccaccio in a translation he made into Latin of a vernacular report on an early mercantile expedition to the islands transcribed in the Zibaldone Maglia Becchiano, known as the De Canaria. The literature of the Tre Corone responded to the same cartographic impulse that produced such monuments as the Carta Pisana. This is the earliest surviving Mediterranean sea chart dating from the last decades of the 13th century. And the Dulcet chart, dated 1339, the earliest signed and dated nautical map to survive, which also registered cartographically for the first time the recent rediscovery of the Canaries. The literary works that Dante, Petrarch, and Boccaccio produced present map-like characteristics that both reflect and construct the spatiality of the world beyond the text in a new way. Their representations of space were formative for the cultural invention not only of Italy, but of Europe as well, with global implications that still resonate for global and Mediterranean studies. Now, my discussion of the mappings of the three crowns this afternoon specifically seeks to explore the thesis that from the beginning of Italian literature, to map the Italian peninsula necessarily involved in one way or another addressing the problem of Italian cultural unity. To represent the proverbial and perennial polycentrism of Italian cultural geography within the geomorphologically discrete and unifying borders of the Italian peninsula had the effect of affirming either implicitly or explicitly an overarching cultural identity. In fact, it would be the map of Italy that would be called upon to hold together Venice and Naples and Florence and Milan and Rome when all else failed. For example, during the Counter-Reformation, from the vantage point of Rome in those fabulous 40 maps frescoed by Ignazio Danti on the walls of the Vatican Gallery of Maps, if you've seen those in the Vatican, between 1580 and 1585. Or in a letter, Alessandro Segni addressed to Francesco Redi from Turin in 1665, in which Segni reported that he was disoriented by the fact that the courtiers there in Torino kept speaking of those Italians as if they were not in Italy, and how he reassured himself by consulting the map of Italy from Blau's recently published Great Atlas. 
And I quote, and yet, he says, in consulting Blau, I realized that in his opinion, I was still within the borders of Italy. Since the premises for an effective political unity were lacking during the Due Trecento and throughout the early modern period until political unification in 1871, awareness of a common civil and cultural identity was among Italians rooted not only in the memory of an ancient cultural heritage and the twists and turns of the questione della lingua, but also in a common perception of the characteristic geomorphological identity of the peninsula. It was Father Dante who long before the rediscovery of Ptolemy first recognized the key role that Italian cartography needed to play if any kind of Italian cultural unification were to be achieved. He consequently undertook to map Italy as a discrete cultural territory in his linguistic treatise, the De Vulgari Eloquentia, on vernacular eloquence, thereby anticipating modernity's typical utilization of the map as a tool in the construction of imagined communities, a famous expression of Benedict Anderson's. The geographer Franco Farinelli has argued that in the treatise, Dante foreshadowed modernity's cartographic ethos insofar as that text offered a bird's eye perspective on the peninsula conceived as a territorial unity bound together by an ideal illustrious vernacular, the vehicle for a projected national political unification informed by reason and a neoclassical rhetorical system. Carlo Dionisotti considered the De Vulgari Eloquentia the entryway and introduction to both the divine comedy and to the Italian literary and cultural tradition as a whole. For Dionisotti, its enduring lesson was its appeal to unity addressed to a fragmented and variegated Italian cultural reality. An appeal, and I quote Dionisotti, that transcended but at the same time implicated that diversity. This might well stand as a commentary on the project of mapping Italy undertaken by Dante, Petrarch, and Boccaccio that I'd like to turn to now. Cartographic Dante. Dante's emphasis on the Italy's geophysical form is noteworthy and arguably constitutes the distinctive characteristic of his cartographic writing, albeit from two very different perspectives in the De Vulgari Eloquentia and the Inferno, respectively. I discuss these in a preliminary manner in order to briefly illustrate some aspects of the mapping of Italy that he undertakes in the poem. Dante famously describes Italy in the linguistic treatise as if he were looking down on a map. And, and these passages, for these first couple of passages from the De Vulgari Eloquentia are number one and two in your handout. The peninsula is described as extending west to east as it appeared in some medieval Mapimundi and as bisected by the mountain chain of the Apennines and divided into right and left sides. Those who say see, si, however, live to the east of those boundaries of the Genoese all the way to that outcrop of Italy from which the Adriatic begins and in Sicily. The bird's eye view topographical description of the peninsula continues in the treatise from farthest to nearest with respect to the boundaries of the Genoese in the west. First, the right side, followed by the left. On the right, Apulia, Rome, the Duchy, Tuscany, and the Genoese marshes. On the left, the other part of Puglia, marshes of Ancona, Romagna, Lombardy, the marshes of Treviso, and Venice. Now, in the Inferno, on the other hand, whose fundamental ethical structuring principle is that down is worse, Dante clearly maps the peninsula from north to south rather than west to east. He traces the cartographic outline of Italy's characteristic topographic features in a series of structurally key similes that articulate the stages of the pilgrim's descent into hell. These begin in Inferno 9, just within the gates of Dis. The first simile of the series renders the passage of the ethical border into lower hell tantamount to descending into Italy from the north. Dante describes, in number three on the handout, 
the burial ground of the heretics at the same time that he evokes the northwest and northeast borders of the peninsula. Si come ad Arli, ove Rodano stagna, si come a Pola, presso del Carnaro, che Italia chiude e suoi termini bagna, fanno i sepulcri tutto il loco varo, così facevan quivi d'ogni parte. Following the longest interval in the poem without a simile, as if to draw attention to the map that he is constructing, Dante next introduces, at number four on the handout, an alpine landscape simile at the beginning of Canto 12, and marks thereby the first of the three subdivisions of the sixth circle of violence. Qual è quella ruina che nel fianco di qua da Trento la dice percosse, o per tremolto o per sostegno manco, che da cima del monte onde si mosse, al piano e si la roccia discoscesa, che alcuna via darebbe a chi su fosse, cotal di quel burato era l'ascesa. Progressing deeper into hell and further down in the geography of the peninsula, an Apenninic terrain is evoked by the poet in Inferno 16 on the eve of the encounter with Gerion and the transition from the seventh circle of violence to the eighth of fraud. The passage is uh, at number five on the handout, taken from Inferno 16. Io lo seguiva e poco eravam iti che il suon dell'acqua ne era si vicino che per parlar saremo appena uditi, come quel fiume che a proprio cammino prima dal vis Monteviso in ver Levante, dalla sinistra costa d'Apenino, che si chiama Acqua Cheta, Suso, Avante, che si divalli giù nel basso letto, e a Forlì, di quel nome e vacante, rimbomba là sovra San Benedetto delle Alpe per cadere ad un'ascesa ove dovea per mille esser recetto, così giù di una ripa discoscesa trovammo risonar quell'acqua tinta, sì che in poco ora avria l'orecchio offesa. The sequence of verbal mappings constitutes a system that culminates in the eighth circle where the fraudulent are punished, or the male bolge, evil pouches, in the elaborate hypothetical simile that opens Inferno 28 by comparing the gruesome bloody filth of the ninth bolgia, pouch, of the sowers of discord to the battlefields of Puglia, or southern Italy. And this is number six on the handout. Se el saunasse ancor tutta la gente che già in su la fortunata terra di Puglia fu del suo sangue dolente, per li troiani e per la lunga guerra delle anella fe si alte spoglie, come Livio scrive che non era, con quella che sentiò di colpi d'oglie per contrastar a Roberto Guiscardo, e l'altra il cui osame ancor si accoglie a Cepperan, là dove fu bugiardo ciascun pugliese, e là da Tagliacozzo, dove senza arme vinse il vecchio Alardo, e qual forato suo membro e qual mozzo mostrasse, da equar sarebbe nulla il modo della nonna bolgia sozzo. The similes of the seventh circle having crossed Italy's borders in Inferno 9 are based upon shattered rock slides and rivers in flood of the Alps and the Apennines, respectively, while here the plains of Apulia are referenced as a means of metonymically referring to the whole of southern Italy. The series of similes raises numerous issues that I can't really address here. What I'd like to emphasize, however, is the way in which Dante effectively repurposes the map of Italy in the transition from the De Vulgari Eloquencia to the Inferno. Both texts have in common the geophysical emphasis on Italy's topographical features, whether from the bird's eye view of the linguistic treatise or from the perspective of the traveler, as in the Commedia. However, the rhetorical function of the map has been quite significantly altered in the shift 
from the rationalist and political project of culture, cultural territorial unification projected in the linguistic treatise to the ethical and allegorical poetic project of the commedia, the polemical, satirical, and comic significance of the correspondence that Dante draws between the map of Italy and lower hell, circles six through nine, is unmistakable. Dante seems to say that while the expression of the concupiscent appetite punished in upper hell, circles one through five, that is the pursuit of food and sex and other goods as if they were food and sex, represents a sinful disposition found without distinction in all of mankind, but the Italians, distinguish themselves, particularly in sins of violence and especially of fraud. Accordingly, as the anthropological portrait of sin progresses up the chain of being, that is, as we descend lower into hell, Italy and its spaces and its languages come into greater focus. In the transition to the poem, the scientific and rational taxonomies of the treatise undergo an ethical translation. The eighth circle, the, the inferno can be said to remap Italy in an ethical and allegorical fashion. The eighth circle of fraud, accordingly, proves to be the region of the poem where the dialogue between the De Vulgar Eloquencia and the inferno becomes most intense and achieves, achieves a kind of crescendo. Dante, in effect, rewrites the linguistic tour of the De Vulgar Eloquencia in his travels through the Eighth Circle, from the Bologna of Venedico Caccianemico in Inferno 18, to the Sardegna Frate Gomita in Inferno 23, to the Romagna of Guido da Montefeltro in Inferno 27. He explores different mappings of Italy in the two texts, the cartographically realistic mapping of Italy that characterizes those chapters of the treatise dedicated to the hunt for the illustrious vernacular is kaleidoscopically reconfigured in the poem's representation of the pilgrim's travel through the Eighth Circle. In the Tuscan-centric tour of the Male Bolge and beyond, the poet explores and charts the more subjective contours of his own mental map of Italy, a tour that punctually highlights in a cartographical passage Dante's birthplace, Inferno 23, 94, 95. In the great city by the fair river Arno, I said to them, I was born and raised, and culminates beyond the limits of Malibolge in the nightmarish apocalyptic geophysical response of the Scriba Dei to the tragedy of Count Ugolino in Inferno 33. The passage given at number seven in the handout ironically, pointedly alludes to the Italy of the De Vulgare Eloquencia, in which the poet had first promoted the theory of an Italian national vernacular, his illustrious vernacular ideal, as the lingua di si, that fair kind land where si is heard. Ai Pisa vituperio delle genti del bel paese dove il si suona, poiché vicini a te punir son lenti, Muova si capraia e la gorgona, e facian siepe ad arno in sulla foce, si che elli anieghi in te ogni persona. The metaphysical and cosmological coherence of the poem is also expressed by this culminating example of infernal cartographic writing, in particular as regards its pronounced geophysical aspect. The islands of the Tuscan archipelago nearest to the mouth of the Arno, as one finds them, as one would find them represented in nautical charts of the time, Capraia and Gorgona, are imaginatively remapped by the Scripa Dei, here in a manner analogous to the way that the relations between earth and land are influenced by virtue of God's power emanating from the heaven of the fixed stars, as Dante explains in the late treatise the Questio de Aqua in Terra, on the location and the form of the water and the land, which he wrote the year before his death, at the same time he was finishing Paradiso, in defense of his authority as a cosmographer and an implicit apologia of the poem's epistemological underpinnings between reason and prophetic inspiration. Dante's cartographic writing as a subgenre 
is a, is a subgenre, if you will, of his cosmological writing in the poem and is deeply rooted in his metaphysics as a full account of the poem's cartographic poetics will need eventually to explain. For instance, Dante's mappings are deeply connected to the poem's truth claims, something to take up perhaps in the discussion period. His mappings of Italy and the Oikumene, of course, do not end with the Inferno. Cartographic writing, in fact, is a characteristic feature of all three cantiche of the Commedia, in which Dante is at pains to map Italy in particular, and his own mental map of the peninsula, including the place of his birth in each of the three canticles. And a metacartographic reflection on the poetic epistemology of the Commedia is indeed focused by Dante in Inferno 28, which maps the Oikumene, Purgatorio 28, which maps the terrestrial globe, and Paradiso 28, which maps the cosmos as a vertical reading of the 28s, as I've tried to show in a forthcoming lectura of the Cambridge Vertical Readings Project. Now, Petrarch is the most explicitly cartographic of the Tre Corone. In one of the letters of old age, we encounter a passage which I've given you in, at number eight in the handout, which I think is the first example of the modern conceit of virtual travel on maps. Therefore, I decided to travel just once on a very long journey by ship or horse or on foot to those lands, but many times on a tiny map with books and the imagination, so that in the course of an hour, I could go to those shores and return as many times as I liked to those distant shores, not only unscathed, but unwearied too, not only with sound body, but with no wear and tear to my shoes, untouched by briars, stones, mud, and dust. The combination of the new humanist literary culture inaugurated by Petrarch with the new modern form of nautical chart made possible the novel technique of virtual or armchair travel by, by map. It's a method which Petrarch would brilliantly exploit in his itinerary to the Holy Land, a pilgrim's guide to the Holy Land, a place that he had never personally visited at the conclusion of which he boasts to the work's addressee that, and I quote, your journey of three months I have completed in three days. The passage cited from Siniles 9-2 probably directly inspired another great cartograph and, and literary world traveler, Ludovico Ariosto, who in the later age of Ptolemy's maps wrote in a justly famous passage from the third satire, and I quote, this is Ariosto, without ever paying an innkeeper, I will go exploring the rest of the world with Ptolemy, whether the world be at peace or at war. I will go bounding over all the seas, more secure aboard my ships than aboard, aboard my maps than aboard ships. And this device will be repeatedly revisited through the early modern and modern periods down to the present, from the beginning of Conrad's Heart of Darkness to the travel map sequence in the Muppets movie. I don't know if you can remember that, it's from 2011. Petrarch's travel by map can be considered in a more or less direct genealogical relation to today's preferred form of virtual travel by means of Google Earth. Now the association between Petrarch and cartography is based in the first place on the author's contacts with contemporary nautical charts of the Mediterranean as well as world maps in the nautical chart style and with cartographers, including perhaps the Venetian Pizzigani brothers, Domenico and Francesco, who were active during Petrarch's lifetime between Venice and Parma, and who authored an important Portland chart in Parma dated 1367. But beyond these external stimuli, Petrarch's cartographic writing really relates to his deepest sources of inspiration and expresses a signature Petrarchan attitude. Traveling the world on maps corresponded to the same bird's eye view or view from above which Petrarch favors throughout his writings and is featured in many of his canonical texts in both poetry and prose on top of the baths of Diocletian looking down upon the ruins of Rome at the end of the famous letter describing his walk around the city with 
uh, Giovanni Colonna, Familiaris 6-1, or at the summit of Mont Ventoux, or from the heights of Selva Piana outside Parma, or looking over Lombardy from San Colombano, as described in a letter to Guido Sette, or surveying all of Italy from high in the Alps in one of his most famous compositions, Ad Italiam, or from the heights of Mont Viso, looking down upon the valley of the Po, in a signature bit of cartographic writing that Petrarch added to the beginning of his Latin translation of the last novella of Boccaccio's Decameron, the Griselda story. It might be worth considering in another context Petrarch's characteristic view from above, including the poet poised over the maps laid out upon a table in relation to the prospect refuge theory of the British geographer J. Appleton, who posited in his The Experience of Landscape that humans prefer to be in positions that give some visual cover or refuge and from one which can, one can look out over large vistas of prospect. For Appleton, this explained the preference for particular types of visual scenes in nature as well as aspects of man's evolutionary history. Now, Petrarch's reputation as a student of cartography and a collector of maps, in any event, came to be recognized as a characteristic feature of his humanism by Boccaccio, to begin with, and was long remembered among later humanists. Around the middle of the 15th century, Flavio Biondo, the greatest of the humanist cartographic writers of the Renaissance, in connection with the description of the Po Delta in the Italia Illustrata, credited Petrarch with no less than the first map of Italy, which, according to Biondo, was authored by Petrarch in collaboration with King Robert of Naples. Most scholars who have examined the question doubt the veracity of the report, although Flavio Biondo may well have consulted a map attributed to Petrarch and King Robert for his account of the hydrographic arrangement of the Po Delta, a feature of Italian geography that Boccaccio will also treat in some detail, based also on some first-hand reconnaissance in his De Montibus, a work that Boccaccio composed in the shadow of the geographical authority of Petrarch, his teacher, and his friend as Boccaccio explicitly acknowledges in the conclusion of his geographical dictionary. Now, whether Petrarch, in fact, collaborated on the first map of Italy, the episode suggests the authority that was attributed to Petrarch in terms of geographical and cartographical knowledge and as a long-distance specialist. It also, and perhaps most importantly, reflects the success of Petrarch's lifelong project of authorizing himself and his poetic and intellectual cultural project by associating them with Italy, that is, Italia Mia, as he called it, in the exordium of the great political canzone, a composition that would echo through the tradition, beginning with Machiavelli's citation of it in the concluding peroration of the prince. Italy, in fact, receives a treatment in Petrarch's works that easily competes with the attention that he lavished on Rome. And Petrarch's Italia could never have been centered in any single city, not even Rome. Rather, Italy emerged in Petrarch's life and writings as a series of points of departure and arrival on an open-ended itinerary that reflected the itinerant character of the life of the son of a Florentine exile begot and born in exile, as he describes himself. The self-styled peregrinus ubique, a pilgrim or wanderer or exile everywhere, repeatedly situates himself in both his life and writings in via, that is, between places and between departure and arrival, between Avignon and Vaucluse, and between the De Viris and the Africa at the beginning of the life and works between the Secretum and the De Remedis during the crucial transition of Middle Age and his definitive move from Provence to Italy, just as he lived between Arqua and Padua and between the Canzoniere and i Trionfi at the end of his life. This characteristic restlessness of Petrarch's life and writing was the result of what the philosopher of place, Edward Casey, would call the author's place panic. 
That is, his deep anxiety about lacking a stable, place-based identity in this world. It is exemplified constantly and obsessively throughout Petrarch's writings that serve to locate a self that had no place in this world and could only manage to fashion a provisional hold on one through his writing. Petrarch association of himself with Italy was an important means of consolidating his threatened and vulnerable sense of place in the world. And Italy, ultimately, was the home toward which Petrarch's journey was directed to the extent that the itinerary of his life in this world can be said to have had a destination, just as Italy would later become the destination of grand tour travelers. A defense of Italy's greatness and superiority over France is the subject of Petrarch's last great polemic, written in 1373, the year before his death, the invective against a detractor of Italy. Now, among the most intriguing examples of this characteristic feature of Petrarch's life and works is found in his testament, a passage from which I've given you, a passage from which I've given you in the handout at number nine. Here, the humanist projects yet one final itinerary or viaggio in Italia. I think Petrarch really had a sense of humor as he was writing his will, even of his mortal remains following his decease. After insisting that he does not care greatly about his burial place, he proceeds to name those places which I have been wont to frequent in Italy and to stipulate the churches in which he would like to be buried. If he were to die in Padua, Arqua, or if in Venice at San Francesco della Vigna, in a place in front of the entrance to the church, or if in Milan, in front of the church of Sant'Ambrogio, near the outer entrance which faces the walls of the city. Or finally, if he dies in Rome, he'd prefer to be buried in Santa Maria Maggiore, or if that can't be managed, St. Peter's will do. This, this final flourish of leaving his burial place in Rome undecided between two places, this is characteristic Petrarch. It's a characteristic Petrarchan move, if you will. It represents an attempt to situate himself uncertainly between two places, as for example, between two different orderings of the last poems of the Canzoniere, and therefore always potentially in movement, never at rest, even post-mortem. Every point of arrival in Petrarch was always implicitly and contemporaneously a point of departure for the next leg of a continuing journey. Now, given Petrarch's preoccupations with specifically spatial aspects of identity and the way these coincided with contemporary cartographical developments, it's perhaps not surprising to find Petrarch being credited with the first map of Italy and with being the first to describe the shape of the peninsula as similar to a boot since that's how it looked to him on contemporary nautical charts. For Pliny, it looked like an oak leaf. He does so in a metrical epistle written in the late 1340s addressed to Lucchino Visconti, book two, number 11, that I'd like to turn to consider now. Unlike Dante, whose map of Italy, whether in the De Vulgaria Loquencia or in the Inferno, focused primarily on the geophysical characteristics of the peninsula, Petrarch's map of Italy is characteristically made up of pairs of place names that construct an itinerary across the space of the peninsula. His verbal map of the peninsula, given here at number 10 in your handout, thus constitutes a spatial emblem of Petrarchan identity. The map constitutes the central matter of the epistle, both in terms of its position within the composition and in terms of its extent. Nearly half of the 60 verse epistle is dedicated to the map. The composition presumes that Petrarch is looking down upon one of the Portland style nautical charts he would later describe himself traveling upon. And if we chart the map of Italy that Petrarch describes in words on the page, we can see that it is developed according to a familiar, characteristically Petrarchan pattern of two points on an itinerary, so that the map is constructed in terms of pairs of places. And this is even more apparent if you map it, as I've done in a very hokey way with using Google Maps. Otranto and Brindisi are paired followed by Crotone and Taranto to begin with. The next leg of the journey is Reggio to Naples, followed by Genoa to Pisa, 
followed by Venice to Ravenna, followed by Rimini to Ancona. The series of pairings is interrupted by the series Milan, Padua, Verona. In reality, I think Milan is meant to stand alone, followed by a resumption of the binary pattern, that is, Milan followed by Padova, Verona. The pattern continues in the remaining segments of the itinerary that enters the interior of the peninsula. Bologna is paired with Florence, while Rieti, which since Varro had been identified as the umbilicus Italiae, is paired with Rome. Again, this binary pattern of points on an itinerary represents a signature spatial characteristic of Petrarch's cartographic writing. His map of Italy thus depicts not a neutral outline of the peninsula as traced on a map, but rather as a self-portrait of his own characteristically anxious spatial identity poised between places and between two centers, implicitly between Milan, the political center, and Rieti, the geographical physical center of Italy. In fact, a deeper spatial identification between Petrarch's biographical spatiality and that of Italy is encoded in the fact that Petrarch has given two different centers to his map, Milan and Rieti. The first is the patria of the dedicatee, Lucchino Visconti, and at a time when Petrarch was currying favor with the recently established Lord of Parma, a place where Petrarch owned a home. Accordingly, Milan is centrally located as if on a map, roughly midway through the passage, and Milan's centrality is further highlighted or underscored structurally by the fact that, as was just mentioned, it's the only city in the entire map that is not paired with another city according to the binary pattern. This fact that Petrarch's map of Italy in the metrical epistle has two centers represents, I think, its most distinctively Petrarchan feature. In a seminal essay, The Canzoniere and the Language of Self, Giuseppe Mazzotta wrote of, and I quote Mazzotta, a doubleness at the moment in which Petrarchan selfhood is constituted. Petrarch is at the same time Actian and Diana, but he is also neither, a double, like the two foci of an ellipsis, always implicating each other and always apart. More recently, in another context, I've tried to argue that the macro text of the Canzoniere expresses, expresses a, a, a structure like an ellipse. The book of 366 lect lyrics does not have one central poem or center point, but rather locates its center unstably between two compositions, poem number 179 and poem number 197. Petrarch's life in writing itself can similarly be mapped as between two points or foci of departure and arrival between Provence and Italy, between the Secretum, the De Remedis, and so on. The center point of Petrarch's map of Italy is accordingly not located in a single city, but is instead between, somewhere between Milan and Rieti. Now, a map of the second day of the, the Cameron. And I feel like with this whole paper, I'm in way over my head with the Petrarch and Boccaccio scholars who are here this afternoon. So please give me your suggestions and feedback. Dante's status as an exile cosmographer wandering the peninsula produced a predominantly geophysical construction of its cartography. The spatially deracinated status of Petrarch as the son of the exile Petracco, born in exile, led him to obsessively map Italy and himself in terms of a never-ending series of itineraries. Boccaccio was also a kind of exile in his own country. Dionisotti speaks of his esilio in patria, in the sense that if the Decameron was on the one hand written in Florence, it nonetheless derived from a narrative impulse that originated in Boccaccio's education and youth spent in Naples, a life he had always before him in memory and that he longed for and for a time hoped to return to. But a no less central, indeed one could argue a more essential exile in patria that fundamentally shaped Boccaccio's life was the circumstances of his illegitimate birth and the uncertainties of his place-based identity that derived from it. 
As Sapegno noted in his Dizionario Biografico degli Italiani essay, in his biographical essay, it's nearly certain that Boccaccio's birthplace was Tuscan, between Certaldo and Florence, although this is, and I quote him, nonetheless contested by some modern scholars in favor of Paris. In any event, the uncertainties of a network of places at the origins of Boccaccio's exilic situation, in contrast to Petrarch's binarisms, are already apparent in this commonplace of his biography, a tripartite or triangular aspect that was no less characterizing than our Petrarch's dualities for Boccaccio's literature. Boccaccio's mapping of Italy in the second day of the Decameron accordingly constitutes a complex relational self-portrait of the author. An important cartographic dimension of the second day of the Decameron, I think, has, has been overlooked, if I'm not mistaken. And I think Boccaccio's cartographic writing in general in the Decameron has been overlooked. What I want to sketch briefly in the final panel of this paper is just a preliminary reconsideration of the second day's cartographic writing, a mode that I believe Boccaccio inherited from Dante and developed quite extensively in his works. As we've seen, Dante traced the contours of a verbal map of Italy in a series of choreographic similes that the reader encounters during this descent through lower hell. Boccaccio similarly orders the tales of the second day according to a geographical criteria, criterion that cumulatively maps the oikumene of the Decameron. And I've given you the rubrics of the day uh, in translation at number 11. I think it's the last thing on the handout, just to kind of refresh your memory of the day and uh, to help you follow this as I go through the sequence. It's an inhabited world that takes Naples in the fifth story of the day, 2-5, Andreuccio story, as its center, while locating the Italian peninsula in the sixth story of the day, Madama Beritola, 2-6, at the center of the Mediterranean basin, which is famously and repeatedly traversed in the seventh story of the day by Alatiel, 2.7. I think it's worth observing at the start how the middle of the day anchors it spatially and provides a cartographical projection very close to that of the nautical charts of the Mediterranean bas basin of the Due Trecento, such as the Carta Pisana. Indeed, the nautical charts of the Due Trecento that I showed you, Due Trecento that I showed you earlier, represent a remarkable cartographic analog to the narrative space of the Decameron. But what's particularly noteworthy about the overarching cartographic development of the second day, I believe, is the way that it reproduces in geospatial terms the thematic pattern that characterizes the day. Critics have explored the manner in which each of the stories illustrates the rise and fall and subsequent further rise of Fortune's Wheel, a cycle from up to down to back up again, and also how most of the day's novelle feature the archetypal journey plot that is of a departure and journey to destination followed by a return home. Yet critics have failed to notice how the development of the geographical settings of the giornata reflect this same overarching pattern. The articulation of the day's geographic itinerary or cartographic itinerary follows, in fact, the same pattern as those of the Wheel of Fortune and of the day's journeys of departure and return, the, the, the day's journeys of departure and return. Boccaccio signals to his reader that the geography of Italy will be important for the day by insisting in the first two stories on the Northeast Italian settings of the novella. The story of Martellino and his Florentine companions, which takes place in Treviso, the first story of the second day, is followed by that of the merchant Rinaldo d'Asti's adventurous adventurous experiences at Castel Guglielmo while on a journey between Bologna and Verona, story 2-2. Boccaccio embarks here upon a territorialization of the Italian peninsula that he will complete during the course of the day. Starting from the northeast quadrant, the day's viaggio in Italia moves from north to south. Novella 2.3 is about a pair of Florentine brothers who moved to England after failing economically in Italy. Um, the journey of a nephew of the brothers back to Italy via Bruges 
leads to his fortunate encounter and enamorment with the disguised daughter of the king of England. The couple continues down to Rome, where no less than pope, the pope marries the pair. At the same time that the third story extends the narrative and spatial parameters of the day to Britain, it also accomplishes a return to the peninsula and a, des and a descent to one of its principal centers. The day is anchored by the central story series of stories that follows, gravitating around southern Italy and the Mediterranean basin. The novelle dedicated to Landolfo Ruffolo, to four, Andreuccio da Perugia, to five, Madonna, Madama Beritola, and Alatiel, they're really organized as two diptychs. Um, on the left, you've got uh, the Landolfo Ruffolo story, has its, as its point of departure, Ravello, along the Amalfi coast. The hero's return to Italy, following adventures in the eastern Mediterranean, is by way of Brindisi and Trani, which serves to include the southeast quadrant of Italy in the map of the Seconda Giornata. The Beritola story, to which I'll return in a moment, brings together the north and south of the peninsula for the first time and the only time in the Decameron, Peritola and Alatiel. And you can see how they, they don't overlap at all except for an intersection with Alexandria that I'll come back to. A return to the north is accomplished in the last three stories of the day. All are based primarily in the north, including the saga of the Count of Antwerp's exile to England and subsequent return to France, the story of the merchant Bernabos, of Genoa's estrangement and reconciliation with his wife, which starts in Paris, involves a journey to Alexandria, but a return to Genoa, and the day's final story of Paganino da Monaco and Bartolomea, which takes place mainly between Pisa the home of the judge and Ricardo di Kinzica, Kinzi, the judge Ricardo di Kinzica, and his wife Bartolomea, and Monaco, the home base of the courser Paganin da Mare. Um, the uh, the novelle novelle two nine and two ten return us to the north of Italy, and specifically in two ten the its northwest quadrant, thus completing the day's periplus of the peninsula. But it's the novella of Madonna Beritola, 2-6, that represents the day's climax as regards Boccaccio's mapping of Italy. Critics have noted how the story brings together many, if not all, of the day's thematic concerns, but not the way in which cartographically it brings together in its plot the north and the south of the peninsula. Madama Beritola, Madonna Beritola's saga is the only novella in the Decameron to do so, and it thus forms a kind of diptych with the similarly summative Mediterranean periplus of Alatiel, the next story and the longest story of the Decameron. Boccaccio brings together north and south in the story of Madonna Beritola, as only he, from among the Tre Corone, was in a position to do by linking his own Neapolitan heritage to the Lunigiana of Dantean memory. In a gesture in which I think he alludes to and recognizes his debt to Dante as a cartographic author of Italy, Boccaccio unites in the Madonna Beritola story the Neapolitan families of the Capece and the Caracciolo and his own literary invention of Beritola, Caracciolo, with no less than Curado Malaspina, the noble Ghibelline who offered hospitality to Dante in the Commedia and who was in the Lunigiana region of Western Tuscany during his exile and who was remembered in the Commedia in a famous cartographic passage, Purgatorio 8, 115 to 118. What bears emphasizing in this context, however, is the extent to which, at the level of the plot, the novella constructs a kind of geopolitical unification of the peninsula around the fictional figure of, Madama Berito, of Madonna Beritola. For the story accomplishes, in the wake of the Sicilian Vespers, the unification by bringing together geographically the north and south, 
and politically Guelphs and Ghibellines thanks to the marriages of the Cavriola's offspring as recounted in the stories de Numont. While one of the sons of Beritola, Giuffredi, marries into the Ghibelline family of the Malaspina, the other, Lo Scacciato, marries into the Genoese Guelph family of Guasparino Doria. The geographical plot of the Madama Beritola novella thus parallels those of the other two geopolitical stories of the day, situated in transitional positions in the opening and closing triptychs. 2-3, you remember, dealt with the dynastic politics surrounding the daughter of the King of England, while those of the Kingdom of France are featured in the story of the Count of Anvers and his two children, 2-8. Novelle 2-3, 2-6, and 2-8 form together a triptych of novelle concerned with national political identity, if you will, constituting a kind of embedded sub-theme for the day, insofar as all three stories involve marriage plots with national political implications. For Boccaccio, Italy evidently constitutes a political and cultural territory analogous to those of the emergent nation states of England and France. What is the nature of the national identity that Boccaccio maps in the second day? For one thing, it's evidently polycentric. Like Petrarch's Italy, it doesn't just have one center around Naples, but two, say Florence, or three, its supranational center, Rome, featured in two, three, or four, Sicily, or five, Genoa, or six, Ravello. The opening of the novella of the Landolfo Ruffolo story, 2-4, describes the Amalfi Coast in an example of cartographic writing that would be comparable to, be, to the beginning of the Promessi Sposi. It's an Italian identity that brings together north and south, center and periphery, Italy between Alexandria and London. And it's this relationship between center and periphery that also seems to be the focus of day two, of, of day two's geospatial complement if we take the Decameron as a map, which I'd submit is the sixth day focused on Florence as defined by the relationship between center, città, and periphery, contado. And perhaps it's worth noting, by the way, that the tenth story of the sixth day, that paradigmatic story for both the structure and the thematic points of view in the, uh, of the sixth day, the novella of Frate Cipolla, takes place in Certaldo, in contrapuntal relation to the fifth story of the second day based in Naples, thus marking a kind of double signature of the author Boccaccio. But be that as it may, the novella of Madama Beritola is emblematic of the specifically Italian focus of the cartographic writing in which Boccaccio is engaged throughout the day and represents a climax under this heading. But recall the way in which Alatiel's periplus of the Mediterranean basin forms a pair or diptych with Madama Beritola's Viaggio in Italia. The stories complement one another spatially with the latter story enclosing the former almost as a frame with barely any overlap from a cartographic perspective, excepting the city of Alexandria, which makes a brief appearance as the destination for Madama, Madama Beritola's son, Giuffredi Gianotto, who escapes from the vile servitude of the Dori in Genoa, only to rimpatriare following his failure to succeed in Alexandria. Alexandria reappears then in 2-7 as the patria and point of departure for Alatiel's saga, and thus represents from a geographical point of view one of those subtle links between stories that Boccaccio uses to connect his tales as a sequence, something like Petrarch does in his poetry linking the microtexts. The Egyptian seaport returns a final time in the penultimate novella of the day as the place where Madonna Ginevra flees from the homicidal jealousy of her husband, Bernabo. As the map of the story illustrates, the plot of 2-9, the second to last story, like its corresponding novella, the second story, from the first part of the day, 2-2, Rinaldo d'Asti, takes place between three locations on the map, Ferrara, Castel Guglielmo, Verona in 2-2, and Paris, Genoa, Alexandria in 2-9. The parallelism of the tripart itineraries is striking. The former is limited to the northwest quadrant of the Italian peninsula, while the latter links and recapitulates the three major geographical scenarios or settings of the day and of the Decameron, namely, 
Northwest Europe, Parigi, Italy, Genoa, and the Mediterranean Basin, Alexandria. What are the deeper implications of Boccaccio's cartographic writing in the second day? What are the ultimate interpretive stakes of its in reflection on the nature of the relationship between space and story. I find intriguing the idea that this pattern of three nodes as an elemental network or DNA of story, departure, arrival, return, such a network underpins not just these stories. The entire day is made up of triptychs at the beginning, at the end, and two diptychs in the middle passage, a structure that is held together by the overarching triptych of the national political stories. Moreover, this tripartite structure, I believe, can ultimately be related to Boccaccio's networked or relational approach to the experience of exile in patria, which produced a third perspective or point of view that enabled him to break out of the jealous, strictly Latin humanism of Petrarch and the rigid Latin vernacular, vernacular high-low binaries that it established and that Petrarch anxiously sought to enforce and preserve. The map of 210 at the end, which takes place between Pisa and Monaco, can be considered a kind of cartographic epilogue with respect to the neat return to the point of departure of Novella 29, which had in a summative manner plotted and emblematically recapitulate recapitulated Northwest European, Italian, and Mediterranean settings of the day in, in its plot line. 2-9 had elegantly recomposed these by achieving the equilibrium of Madonna Ginevra's return from Alexandria to Bernabo and to Genoa in the penultimate story of the day. Thus, Dioneo's last story might be considered in its subversive, uh, in its, uh, subversive way as an, an, an extra Italian denouement in which Bartolomea elects to remain in Monaco rather than return to her husband in Pisa, a cartographical supplement analogous in spatial and narrative aesthetic terms to the logic of mercantile profit that Sergio Zatti found to inform paradigmatically the structure of the stories of the day, whereby the return to equilibrium following a ride on fortune's wheel leads in every case to some measure of gain or profit with respect to an original point of departure. The Tre Corone were really already engaged in mapping Italy as part of their various constructions of an Italian cultural identity well before the Quattrocento circulation of Ptolemy. And the topic is worthy of further investigation. I think the cartographic inscriptions of Italia by the Tre Corone have a continuing resonance for contemporary reflection and debate about what the cultural geographer Dennis Cosgrove described as the most general challenge facing the humanities today, and I quote him, that is critically understanding ourselves and our participation in nature by illuminating the Earth's spatial and environmental dimensions. In fact, Italy's, Dante's Italy is about la terra, the earth, the land, la luola che ci fa tanto feroci, the threshing floor that makes us so ferocious. As he termed it, looking down upon the earth, from the perspective of the fixed stars and specifically humankind's relation to the earth as home to the human community in time and space, which to view it from the heavens has always been, has always had the effect since Scipio's dream of putting humankind's ambitions into perspective, whether they be political, commercial, or some combination of the two. Petrarch's fragmentary and discontinuous mappings of Italy, on the other hand, are designed to momentarily fix or consolidate the spatiality of the position of the subject, who lacking a place in the world sets out to make one for the self. And you can easily imagine Petrarch in the age of personal GPS systems, devices, and social media, with the epistolary as a kind of Facebook and the global exchange of Petrarch and sonnets as a kind of network of Twitters. Boccaccio finally imagined Italy at the center of the Mediterranean basin mediating the more or less harmonious flow of people, goods, and cultures between the northwest of Europe and the southeast of the Mediterranean. It was an idealized and nostalgic portrayal already in Boccaccio's time, but perhaps for this reason worth reflecting on as we try to imagine alternatives to the map of the border between the global core and the periphery that today runs between Lampedusa and North Africa. Thank you.
So I'd like to thank Professor Kashi very much indeed for that just fascinating paper, very elegant, extremely rich, and I thought impressive in the number of, um, of kind of new and fresh points it had to make about all three Corone. That's a real tour de force. So I'm hoping you'll take some questions. I wonder whether I might just start us off with an extremely general question, which would be... This research is going to be part of a book, presumably on all three. Yes, I'm stopping. I'm not going to be the academic director anymore, and so that's the top of my list is to uh, put this together as a book. And I think the um, all three of the the three crowns are very ripe for this type of uh, discussion. Um, and there could actually be three books. <laughs> but um, so this is, this is just a, a kind of a proof of concept paper. And um, as I alluded to in the discussion of Dante, it, it's extremely important for Dante and it hasn't been studied really very much at all, um, this uh, cartographical dimension and how important it is for understanding Dante's cosmology and his cosmography. Um, and so I think that's, that's where I'm starting. I'm, um, there's a lot to do on Dante. I need to understand Boccaccio a lot better. I need help from Jason and other colleagues. Um, Boccaccio is uh, full of this. I, I don't know if you would agree, but I, I, I mean, I was really surprised to find that, you know, the second day of the Decameron is really laying out the geography of the whole collection. It's also from a structural point of view, it's kind of what you would expect. Second day, uh, the first day with the theme, and it's, it's kind of the entrance to the work as a whole. And so appropriately, he, he, gives us a, he gives us a map of the inhabited world of the Decameron, which is programmatic, um, really. And, and then there's, there's so many um, interesting dimensions regarding the relationship between Petrarch and, and Boccaccio on this topic. Um, both Petrarch and Boccaccio are extremely important for early modernity and cart, you know, modern cartography, <coughs> the, the issue of cartography and literature. So thank you for the question and the encouragement to <laughs> Oh, well, thank you, Ted, for an incredibly rich, um, I burned up an entire notebook um, of just thinking about what you've said and adding to our, my perspective on, on Boccaccio, on Dante and Petrarch. Um, there are a million questions I could ask, and maybe someday we'll have yeah, a meal continue, to go over this. I'd love that. But you ended in a way that almost, the last bit where you talked about Dante uh, and quoted the, 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 the threshing floor, Dante is the moralist map maker. Petrarch is the fragmented map maker and, and Boccaccio is the mediating map maker. Uh, I don't know how to say it. it. Disappointed me a little bit because it, it came back to some self-fashioning that we've got in as critics about those three guys. So I, let me ask the question, who's the best map maker besides their own predilections to be the authors that we make them out to be. Dante the moralist, Boccaccio the fragmented guy, uh, Boccaccio the mediator. Who, who's the best map maker uh, yeah, from a, a kind of an objective view, if you want, or thanks, something like thanks that? Thanks for pointing out the weaknesses of my paper, well, which, no, I was, which I was very aware of. I was trying to get out of this. You know, <laughs> and so I kind of collapsed it at the end into, um, which are, they're, 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 yeah, there's a, kind, there's a kind of facility in the, the, the exit. Um, who's the best map maker? That's kind of an early, mo that's kind of a modern perspective on map making, is to, to try and measure it in terms of its accuracy or its plausibility or you know, what it's actually mapping. And I think um, what's interesting in these authors is the way in which mapping is a part of their rhetorical self-fashioning, as, as you mentioned. Um, which, which we don't really under, we, we haven't really explored, I don't think, uh, to, to a large extent. And so 
I'm, I'm, really, I'm really starting there. I think Dante certainly is the most comprehensive. I mean, he maps the cosmos in Paradise 28. And, and, he, and at the same time that he maps the cosmos, I'm thinking of that, that design of the circle of the, that, that he sees as he's going into the, um, uh, he's in the Primo Mobile and he's about to go into the Empyrean and he sees projected the um, nine circles of the heavens, of the angelic hierarchy as a kind of, I would argue, a kind of manda mandala. You know, it's, it's a kind of almost like an Indian object of contemplation, which is a mapping that is to uh, map the cosmos, but also deconstruct the map of the cosmos and to transcend uh, the map of the cosmos. Uh, transcend, the, transcend both writing and uh, mapping. I mean, I think, I, mapping and writing have so much in common. So all the meta-literary dimensions of Dante, which are so rich, I mean, he's the most, he's the most self-conscious and meta-literary author of the whole literary tradition before the 20th century, before modernism. You know, there's no author that you can think of who is so aggressively deconstructing their work at the same time that they're constructing it. So I guess as a mapping project, I think Dante's is the most sublime. It's the most metaphysically rich. Um, and I also think that it has a lot to teach us about the history of cartography itself. For example, the transition from a modernist cartography, which is all about accuracy, the the governance of the territory, the establishment of the territory, um, which was characteristic of a modernist and modern approaches to cartography, corresponds very much to what Dante is doing in the De Vulgaria Loquencia. I mean, it's remarkable. He could be, he could be a, 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 a very modern author. Ter you know, the, the, the link between the map and the territorialization of a political space is, is incredibly uh, uh, forward thinking in, in the case of Dante. And then, but then he blows it up when he goes into the, uh, into the, the poem. It's all about uh, questioning and, and deconstructing and un undermining mapping and writing at one level. So he kind of goes through what we've had to go through in the history of cartography from uh, naive uh, premises about the relationship between mapping and accuracy and realizing that the map is always a projection of a cultural point of view. The map is always the projection of a subjective or a, a, a political, a rhetorical uh, program. Um, and, 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 and so I, I feel like, I think Dante, in many respects, I would, I would put at the head of the class, but wouldn't we, in general, I mean, Dante, I, with no, off no offense to Boccaccio, Jason, but, <laughs> or Petrarch, it's hard, it's hard to put, you know, Dante's at another level in about every category. So, on the other hand, <laughs> uh, both Petrarch and Boccaccio, it seems to me, some, some of you may be familiar with a very influential book that was written by Tom Conley called The Self-Made Map. It's about French early modern uh, mapping, the relationship between early modern mapping and literature. And it's, it's a wonderful book, and it kind of invented this whole, what you were alluding to at the beginning, this whole fashion of cartography and literature coming out of the French tradition. And when I read that book, I, I, this, it was one of the books that kind of suggested to me this line of inquiry. I said, Petrarch's already doing it, <laughs> you know. The, I, th I think that the, the uh, uh, transition in culture uh, that Petrarch is uh, expressing in his mapping, his cartographic writing, is really something that's important to understand, to understand modern cartographical writing in general. Um, I think Boccaccio, if I could say, I put in a word for Boccaccio, and I mentioned this and kind of alluded to it, and I really learned this, were you involved at, they, they had a conference on Boccaccio, Renaissance Boccaccio, a few years ago, at uh, Berkeley. And it really brought home to me, and a lot, and, and I think some of the most uh, the most important work that's going on in the United States, anyway, in the Tre Corone, is like your own and others around Boccaccio. Boccaccio is, I think, we're we're recognizing the modernity of Boccaccio that he's so he's so rich and he's so much more interesting than Petrarch, <laughs> in many respects. And, 
You don't agree with that. You don't agree with that. I like to mix it up, you know what I'm saying? But no, but that's an indefensible position, I realize, but that's one of the reasons why I threw it out there. Uh, thank you so much for your talk, but I apologize. I don't actually have fully fleshed out questions, but I have two um, things that I was hoping you could uh, talk a little bit more about in relation to your presentation today and then the other work that you've done on travel writing. And the first is about the um, role of first-hand observation or um, second-hand observation <laughs> and that authority that comes with observation um, that we see showing up on Quattrocento maps like Framoros and um, you know which you know people have been starting to think about in terms of text image relationship um, and then the second thing I'd love to hear you speak more about is uh, if you see some continuity between um, this textual mapping and the writing of, of Dante and Boccaccio and Petrarch, and then the travel narratives that come in the 15th and 16th century, like Cadamosto or um, Pigafetta and, um, and other Italians, if, if they themselves see a continuity with that writing from the earlier periods, or uh, if there are certain hallmarks of this narrative style that's put in terms of not fiction, but, but truthful observation? Taking the, the second first, uh, the, the text that I mentioned by Boccaccio called the De Canaria, which, he, which is, uh, it was a letter about the um, earliest encounters, New World encounters in the Canary Islands, is really at the beginning of this tradition of Cadamosto, Pigafetta, Vespucci, and so on. And so there's a, um, and, and this is where my interest in the Canary Islands really comes from because in so many ways, and there's been wonderful scholarship on this done by uh, uh, Fernandez Armesto and uh, others, and, and uh, uh, the, the way that the discovery of the Canary Islands is kind of a, in many respects, a trial run or a, a prelude for the um, encounter with the New World. And it's interesting that the Italians are in the middle of it. You know, they, they are, uh, and as writers, uh, so that the Italian travel writing tradition is really central, um, including Columbus, if you will. I mean, he is an Italian after all. But the, the, um, the, the Spucci, certainly. Um, Verrazzano is an extremely interesting author for the way that he, um, and th I'm coming to your question about the relationship between the real and the ideal, if you will. Um, Verrazzano, too, it's, it's like Arcadia. It's, a, it's, a, it's an encounter with the new world which has a combination of accurate description and scientific uh, elements, and it's bringing back the, the true report of the new worlds that have been discovered but, at the, but there's, not a, there's not yet, in this early period, in the Renaissance period, I would say, a rigid boundary between the imaginative and literary, literary dimensions of those accounts and the more, uh, what we would term the more scientific or uh, objective report. And one of the things that's kind of hard to get used to and hard to learn to do is to, to appreciate that they are both there together. Um, and uh, um, it, it's, it's something that uh, never really goes completely away from travel writing, but certainly these, this, this Italian tradition, uh, already in Boccaccio's De Canaria, you have the beginning of the noble savage. He, you know, he, he takes a, a mercantile report and turns it into a kind of idealized encounter between <laughs> noble savages and the Europeans. There's, there's already this impulse for a kind of literary reimagining of, 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 the, of the encounter, um, which is the, the nature of literature and rhetoric, I think. Um, I'm just increasingly interested in, in these truth claims that are made on maps in the mid-15th century and later uh, before you, you know, before the textual descriptions are evacuated um, from the maps themselves, but you know this claim that um, maybe I haven't seen it, but I know somebody who has seen these monstrous creatures here, or 
there are reports that there are unicorns in Africa, but no one can really confirm it, so I'm just putting this here, you know, so that you know about it, but... Uh, so I'm... Uh, the truth claim is really uh, fundamental, yeah. And, and given that these three authors that you're talking about today haven't been in all of the places that they're talking about, I wonder like, if, they're, if you can get a sense of where this becomes so critical, or when, when this becomes the crux of, of when an author is to be believed, um, you know, it, when first-hand observation or experience of a place becomes... Right. more important than the poetics of it, or if that's not even something. Again, my, my, again, my impulse is to not rigidly distinguish, because, for example, the truth claim, that's the traveler's tale, right? The truth claim is a fundamental part of the traveler's tale, whether it's the most crazy, uh, Lucian-esque uh, invention, or if it's a, uh, an accurate account. The, the, the truth claim is kind of a common thread. And in, in you know, I, just, just to get started, I mean, in Dante, the truth claim, that's where the truth claim is so tied up in his journey. The encounter with the uh, monster Gerion in Inferno 16 is exactly the moment where he swears on the truth of the poem and he also gives the, the poem's title, Commedia. And that, that it, Dante had an incredible insight into the, um, the, uh, the, the key, the vital, the centrality of the truth claim for any kind of literary account. I mean, whether you're a traveler or you're giving an account of anything, you're, you're, you're making a claim about its validity, its, its truth. And he, I think, has a, has a very prou profound reflection about the nature of the truth claim of the, tra the traveler's tale, if you will. And so I, I would invite you to look at some of the literature around the Gerion episode, which has been, become a real flashpoint in Dante studies because it's central to understanding what you think Dante believes himself about the nature of his poem. Did he really see Gerion? Are we supposed to believe that he saw Gerion? You know, and so on and so forth. Petrarch, Petrarch is more moving in the direction, I mean, Dante's raising the metaphysical question of the truth claim. You know, geographical description has always been part of epic literature, right? Why, why, do the, why does epic literature always have lots of geographical uh, material? Lucan is probably the best example in the classical period. Because that, that gives you authority, that if you know where is where and what's, then you know what's what. Then there's, you know, there, there's, a, there's authority and uh, reliability are always tied up in geography, you know, in general. Um, Petrarch really develops this quite a bit. I mean, he, and I was alluding to this when I was talking about, you know, people are attributing to him the first map of Italy. He's the author of Italy because he has this fame of he goes everywhere, he's the traveler. He, whether it's his physical movements around, he's going all over Italy, he's between Provence, and, which he hyperbolizes. You know, he makes a lot like the, the, the journey to the Holy Land. He'd never been there. He does it in his imagination. It's very much part of his authorial identity is this relation, relationship between his authority, his truth claim, if you will, and his travels and his knowledge of geography, which Boccaccio <coughs> continues this, and you start to, you know, I, I'm, I'm staying away from, or I'm, I'm earlier than the Ptolemy, when you really begin to see there is a kind of breakthrough, and people are discovering real new territory, and they're having to map it, and they're having to tell the tale, but also accurately measure it and put it on a map with latitude and longitude. So it becomes a, a, a somewhat different problem. I'm sorry for the rambling answer. This is kind of following on from, from one point you were making. I was very struck in, in what you were saying about Petrarch, about that detail of beyond the attributing the first map of Italy to him. And I was kind of thinking more generally about the ways in which um, the reception of these authors in very cartographically conscious periods, like the 15th and 16th century, you know, what they could, that could tell us about the authors themselves. 
And I was thinking specifically about literary pilgrimage. Um, I was thinking about the way in which in the 16th century you get this certainly literary habit, I don't know how widespread it was in practice, of going to visit the sites of Petrarch and Laura in Avignon. And there's this hilarious dialogue by Niccolo Franco about uh -huh. that kind of Petrarch-related tourism. And what seems interesting there is, A, it's kind of picking up on the sense of place that's implicit in the lyric poetry. But also, I mean, it seems to me that Petrarch is really one of the modern inventors of literary pilgrimage. He writes that um, letter in the letters to posterity about <coughs> being in Padua, close to the burial places of both Livy and St. Justina. And it's really, you know, pilgrimage mm -hmm. in a very kind of literal, transferred sense. And that was fascinating. I thought about the, the testament, the passage in the testament, that he's actually kind of strewing the whole of Italy with potential mm -hmm. Petrarchan <laughs> literary pilgrimage sites, as though he can't bear the thought that there might only be one. That it will. And it's interesting, that's, def that's definitely part of his, his project, is to create the places of Petrarch. Um, a really early and interesting example of this Petrarchan phenomenon that you're describing is Vellutello's commentary on Petrarch, which if you're not familiar with it, um, has a map. It, it, it's one of the earliest maps, printed maps, in an Italian Renaissance edition. Uh, after the, interestingly, after the maps of mapping Dante's hell in the, you know, they come out of the Florentine Quattrocento, the end of the 15th century and the early 16th century, the earliest map, maps, I believe, are uh, Thomas More on the one hand, but more or less um, uh, uh, the Utopia that has a famous map. Um, but similarly, uh, Vellutello's commentary on Petrarch has uh, a map of Provence, which is, I think, uh, the point I would make about that in response to, to what you're mentioning is that there's a kind of changed environment so that the, there's a historicization and a uh, implotment, if you will, of Petrarch and his story um, that are, that's very much of a, of a piece with the Renaissance reception, with a Renaissance uh, spatial awareness, so that Velutello actually reconstructs the ordering of the canzoniere according to a kind of, you know, conception of a narrative conception that he, um, that's also a part of a, a kind of changed, uh, historical environment which is I think part of the uh, period of the discoveries, the period of emerging national identities and so on and so it's a, it's a very, for that reason I think Petrarchism is such an interesting international theme, the way that it uh, uh, relates to the history of space, of li literary space in early modern Europe more generally but, but the, the, the Velutello is really quite an interesting example, and I don't think much has been done with it, uh, has, has been developed in this sense. So it's, I think it's no, really, I think it's, it has. I mean, I think it's that's really interesting the, suggestion. That's what the Franco text is satirizing, really, this very literal-minded uh -huh. um, kind of cartographic reading of, of Petra, which is obviously ridiculous on, on, the, on, the, on one level, but I was thinking, you know, it's at the level of literary pilgrimage that it begins to make a bit more sense and, and seem more related to Petra. I was just going to add a point to that conversation that Boccaccio's last letter is basically a response to P Petrarch's testamentum to Francesco Borsano saying, now Arqua will be a place of literary pilgrimage. They right. will stop going to Florence, they will stop going to Bologna, they will right. he, he kind of responds to that saying he's been buried in Arqua, so this will, you know, this will be a greater pilgrimage site than, the, than Halicarnassus, the mausoleum, all the great places that all the people went to to honor the dead, now they'll come to Arqua, as if setting up yet another pole in that no longer binary structure of Italy where it's not just Florence and Naples or Florence and Avignon or Florence and... Now we've got to add Arqua to the list because yeah. uh, Petrarch being there, so just to... 
to add to that conversation. Well, forgive me, but it all goes back to Dante, you know, the monument to Dante. I mean, the whole issue of Dante's burial and, and, and the whole issue of the, of, the, of the sites of the burial of the authors is a, already a contested issue at that time. Boy, you've been very patient. <laughs> well, if there are no more questions, let's just um, thank Professor Kashi. Thank you. Thank you.